What's up guys, welcome to Daily Dose of Reddit, this is your host, Zach, and today's subreddit is r slash pro revenge. Alright, this story's called, Try to scam me out of rent money? Have fun paying back six times the amount, losing all your friends, and getting exposed for your lies. <laughs> Obligatory, not sure if this qualifies as pro, but it is definitely a step above petty. The ultimate result did give me ultimate satisfaction to see this girl try to scam me, fail terribly, and have to face financial financial, social, and legal consequences. This happened to me last year. On my university Facebook page, I found a posting for a sublease offer by a girl named Wendy. She was transferring out of the university and needed her room rented out. It was an individual lease, so I wouldn't have to worry about damages in the shared space. I had my own deadbolt and key fob for my door, and the shared bathroom was huge, so I didn't even care if it stayed messy. I met the other roommates, we hit it off, and within a week, I had signed the sublease. I learned my lesson from my previous renting situations and made sure to only sign a semester sublease with Wendy. I explained to her that I didn't want to be stuck in another lease and waiting for it to expire if my new roommates and I were not compatible. I also didn't want a lease during the summer when I didn't have plans to live on campus. She was fine with this as no one else was willing to pay her the full amount of monthly rent. A semester went by and my roommates were nice, so I didn't think twice about extending my sublease until the end of May. School would be over by May 5th, and I already had a new apartment near my internship lined up for June 1st. I told this all to Wendy four months in advance, so she would have plenty of time to find someone to move into my room for the summer. Since I signed my lease extension, I had noticed that the quality of living in my complex had tanked to new lows. If you've never lived in a student apartment complex, they're pretty much run like dorms, though they are marginally cheaper and have more privacy with individual rooms. The past few months, I noticed that none of the public toilets in the gym or study floors were being cleaned. The security guard would let random drunk people use the facilities inside, none of the lights on a floor of the parking garage worked, and there would be alcohol and vomit for days in the hallways, and the trash chutes were constantly jammed and overflowing, causing my entire floor to reek of garbage. We also had frequent plumbing and heating issues. Management seemed to do the bare minimum at their own pace to fix these problems. This would all come back later. So in December, I paid $5,500 plus fees for rent, utility service for December through May. Note, I paid for the upcoming semester along with my last month's rent before my initial lease expired. Not smart, but I had cleaned out my entire savings to do this so I didn't have to worry about late payments, e-check fees, or scrambling to pay rent at the end of each month. I worked a minimum wage, tip-based job, and there were so many stupid fees just for paying rent that were eating up my paychecks, and cash was not allowed. Ultimately, I realized it was cheaper to prepay the rent and just live paycheck to paycheck for my food costs. Since this was a student building, the rent portal worked on credits and would just subtract monthly from any prepaid direct deposit. We also had a utility cap, so I never had to worry about any more payments. Now for the part where Wendy screwed up. May rolls around and I double check with Wendy that I am moving back home right after finals, May 4th, and the new tenant can move in starting June 1st since I paid until the end of May. I told her that if anyone wants to move in earlier than June 1st to contact me because I didn't want to return my keys yet and it would be nice to get some money back for the empty apartment I'm paying for. She agreed to this. All my things were moved out except for sheets and a single pillow just in case I wanted to visit my friends or work an extra shift in May. Wendy calls me the day after I move and cries and cries about how she cannot find anyone to take over the rest of the lease and if I could extend into the summer. She has another apartment signed at her new school and cannot afford the rent for both. I tell her I'm in the same situation with my new apartment, so I can't afford to rent an empty room either. At the end of the day, her name 
name is on the lease and not mine. She does not take this well. May 15th. I get a $1,000 charge on my account from the rental company for June rent and for losing my keys and a noise complaint violation. I call management right away because no one was supposed to be home and realize it's not the lady who has been working there for the past nine months, but someone completely different. Turns out, older management knew they were being replaced since a national rental company bought the building. So, they completely gave up on any upkeep during the months that they were being phased out. They hadn't even filed my sublease contract from December, for which I had paid a hefty contract filing fee. Because Wendy never bothered to sign it. She just ignored the email they sent requesting her electronic signature, and management was too lazy to look into it because I had prepaid for the semester, and they never had to bother Wendy for any late payments payments. New management just assumed I was the new lesser, lesser, leaser, or a relative of Wendy's since my account was linked to the unit's rent portal. On top of the old management screw-up, Wendy knew about the lack of proper sublease contract and used it to her advantage. She offered a new sublease discounted rent to move in for the full summer. Wendy essentially charged two months rent for four months of living, but was only able to do so since I had paid for the free month she was offering to her subleaser, and my damage deposit covered the last month's rent. She was actually gaining an extra $700 out of the deal, on top of having her rent fully covered for the last four months of her lease. She had a new sublease drafted by the ever-clueless new manager and set the start date as May 6th, overlapping my contract which ended on May 31st. To explain the lack of returned keys, Wendy also called management and said that she had lost her keys during moving, and to just charge her portal for the replacement when the sublease moved in. She assumed that this charge would be revoked when I returned my keys, and the unpaid rent for the last month would be subtracted from my damage deposit, so I'd be none the wiser. She did not think that I would still be checking my rent portal occasionally after I moved out. This meant that from the very next day I moved out, someone had been living in my room, which I paid for without my knowledge or the knowledge of any of my other roommates who had gone on summer vacation. I was livid, but I still tried to patch things up between us. I offered to schedule an appointment at our local tenants union for mediation, and I even offered to just have her family talk to mine in case there were other personal issues that prevented Wendy from paying. She wrote me back a nasty email from her lawyer saying she had saved a Snapchat of my roommates, her friends since high school, smoking pot and drinking during my birthday party in the apartment, and she wouldn't hesitate to send it to my boss, academic advisor, and the building manager. Pot is legal. I was 22, I had just passed a drug test for my internship, and I was not even present in the picture she had. So I'm not sure what she would have accomplished through this other than ratting out her own friends or incurring a smoking fine on her own lease. Plus, I'm not aware of any lawyer who would threaten blackmail and send it through their client's personal email address. She also said she needed the extra money for damages and cleaning, citing the pillow I left in the room as evidence of a lack of cleaning. Well, all of the cleaning fees would have been avoided if she told me someone was moving in. Blackmailing me into giving up a full month's rent to throw away a mere pillow and blankets I left because I was still paying for the room? Nuclear option it would have to be. I contacted the university's free legal services and had them explain the process and required papers and documents I would need to get her in civil court. Since she was no longer a student, I was able to receive help without any conflict of interest under their student tenant issues advisor. The legal counsel suggested I try to pursue a court-operated mediation for the issue and follow with a civil suit if the mediation didn't work. They referred me to a local lawyer who does this sort of work pro bo 
bono to prevent companies from taking advantage of inexperienced students, who gladly helped me. At this point, I had received enough rude emails from her brother and her boyfriend calling me a junkie and a scammer for trying to extort money from Wendy, their pure angel. I sent the court mediation paperwork straight to her family's home address, just to expose her to everyone who she had told that I was just a crazy drug addict trying to steal her money. Then, I took her nasty email and forwarded it to every person included in the picture that she was trying to hold over me. I simply believed they deserved to know that their friend didn't care about any possible fallout they might experience and was using their post image to blackmail someone. Finally, I spoke to the new management about their missing contract I had paid extra money to file. New manager admitted she was too overwhelmed by the massive pile of garbage the building had become to do her due diligence and did have to concede she made a mistake once she saw my saved copy of the lease extension. But she still could not evict the new tenant since it was my sublease extension that was invalid without Wendy's signature. I had new manager send me the new tenant's contract and forwarded the overlapping leases and utility overage receipts since January to the accounting fraud department of the management company and new manager's boss who was in charge of making sure the transition between management was smooth. I made sure to hammer in the fact that had anything gone wrong since December, I could have been evicted for illegal subletting after the company had accepted payment, just because Wendy didn't feel like signing a contract and no one bothered to follow up on this. Within a day, I had not only received the $700 refund meant for May, but over seven times more more. The company wanted to wash its hands of any liability in this mess they had inadvertently helped orchestrate, so they just reverted the direct deposit which included the overlapping month in question. But that payment had been made in December, so I got back six months of rent, utilities, deposit, and fees. I essentially got back a semester's worth of rent, plus December, as the original lesser leaser to the unit Wendy was now liable for all seven months of payment, including the deposit, since my living situation there could only be legally classified by the building as an unauthorized verbal contract. If Wendy had agreed to mediation at the tenants' union or even just through local court, we would have only disputed $700, and likely a significant portion of it would have been eaten up through court fees or paying the mediator. I waited for a while after my payout to really make her swear wet from the pressure of the court requesting her presence and the building manager requesting $6,000 in unpaid rent. I knew the building manager was leaving her and her parents voicemails daily about the need to call her back and fix the situation before it got worse, but they were all avoiding calls at this point. Eventually, her family had to hire a real lawyer to get back to me about revisiting an out-of-court mediation. Finally, I sent her a saccharine email explaining that I was willing to cancel the upcoming mediation request at the local courthouse, but only because I got back what I wanted and more. I told her that if she, her family, her pretend lawyer, or her real lawyer wanted to call me and settle my rent, I would be happy to pay for the time I lived there, and she could handle the rest on her own, like she should have done in the first place. I think her family was too embarrassed to even ask for rent from December to May and couldn't deny their daughter had been lying this whole time, especially since they had to pay for a lawyer on top of everything else to clean up her mess. They never requested that I pay them back at all and I have not heard or seen her since. None of her friends from my school are friendly with her anymore and their families are not on cordial terms since the email I forwarded to her friends spread like wildfire. I'm not sure about the financial fallout of this on her end. According to the local rumor mill, her upper middle class parents bailed their darling princess out of it, and the building absorbed the loss on utilities and fees for its own mistakes. But I'm sure she won't be trying to scam anyone else for a while.
<laughs> Serves you right, you scamming scammer, trying to scam a college student out of thousands of dollars, you jerk. What a jerk. She's a jerk. Okay, but OP, you're a good person for even offering to give her some of the money back because <laughs> that was rightfully yours after what you had to put up with. This story's called... This was a comment from another user on r slash gifts. A city near me had a farmer holding out as the city expanded. The city wouldn't let him sell his land zoned commercial, since it was a farm, while completely surrounded by commercial development. The city wanted him to sell the land zoned for agriculture, basically to let some developer bulldoze the fields and flip it for commercial space, easily ten times, settled into a stalemate. The area became more and more developed. Developed. Housing encroached on the back of the property. The farmer, getting old and getting tired of this crap, not wanting to pass this fight on to his kids, came up with a plan. The property had been used for soybean and farming corn to this point, not really a burden to his neighbors. He applied to receive proper licensing from the state for a hog confinement lot. In case you don't know, that is where you keep tens of thousands of hogs before they are brought to market normally located deep in the farm country, stinks for miles. The city tried to stop him legally, but they never incorporated the land in the first place. They tried to stop it at the state. He followed the process to the letter, and well, it is farmland. They thought he wouldn't follow through, maybe. He did. He had 400 hogs delivered to what at this point was one of the busiest roads in town. The locals nearly lynched the city council. In less than a week, the city backtracked a nearly 20-year feud and let him sell his farm for the fair commercial rate as he had originally bargained for. That's an amazing story, and that old man is a clever, clever guy. Because <laughs> pigs, they do stink. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and hit that bell to never miss an episode.